Welcome to the High Point Architecture Virtual Tour as part of the 250th birthday celebration for Guilford County, North Carolina. This presentation is intended for students and those interested in history and historic preservation. My name is Sherry Teal. I'm an architectural historian and work in cultural resource management. I travel the United States researching and evaluating buildings for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Special thanks go to Greensboro Preservation Incorporated and Executive Director Benjamin Briggs and the High Point Public Library. The inspiration for this presentation happened when I moved back to North Carolina and lived in High Point. I was immediately impressed by the variety and quality of styles of architecture, including Tudor Revival style, Renaissance Revival style, Art Deco, Art Moderne, and modern architecture styles. How did High Point come to have so many buildings professionally recognized for their design and artistic features for a city of its size? This virtual tour will provide a glimpse of the homes and businesses that have made the built environment of High Point historically significant. I invite you to explore High Point too, but remember, some of these buildings featured are privately held properties. Buildings are a part of our cultural landscape. They are living spaces that have recorded who has lived in the community and why, and the happenings within their walls inform us about the national, regional, and local events that have shaped our communities. The ways in which these buildings continue to be used and preserved becomes an extension of that history and a bridge to the past for future generations to explore. Mm -hmm. High Point is located between Greensboro and Winston-Salem and considered part of the Triad region. High Point's boundaries extend into four different counties. Quakers from Pennsylvania, traveling along the Great Wagon Road, settled in the High Point area in the mid-1700s. Initially, they constructed small buildings like the Friends School and Meeting House in Jamestown. These buildings were modest with one, two, or three rooms based on a floor plan with a central hall. But their brickwork was expertly laid in elaborate patterns for the area and time. This brick pattern is called Flemish Bond. By the 1850s, the community surrounding High Point grew as a plank road between Fayetteville and Salem and a railroad between Goldsboro and Charlotte were completed. In 1859, High Point was incorporated. High Point was named for being the highest point on the Southern Railroad. The Southern Railway Passenger Depot was constructed in 1907 by the Southern Railroad Company and is one of the best examples of Richardsonian Romanesque style architecture in North Carolina. N, W, and S of the Southern Railway was attributed with its design the building has a French ceramic tiled roof, rows of windows with double coarse brick arches to allow natural light into the building, broad eaves with exposed rafters to shelter travelers, and sits upon a rusticated granite foundation that adds weight and a sense of permanence to the design. The railroad brought commerce and opportunity to High Point and was a contributing factor to the rise of the textile and furniture industry in the early 20th century. At the turn of the 20th century came the sports hunters. The railroad brought the wealthy business people from the Durham tobacco and textile industries into the High Point area for leisure activities, especially quail hunting. These business tycoons built homes on expansive estates and entertained people such as J.P. Morgan, who was at the time one of the richest men in America. In 1908, John Blackwell Cobb, the president of the American Tobacco Company, built what he named the Manor on his Sedgefield estate just north of High Point. He enjoyed his, quote, hunting lodge so much that he had an image of himself and his friends with the Manor in the background printed on one of his Caswell Club cigar boxes. Other business people introduced to the High Point area through hunting and social events saw the opportunity in High Point to become a major manufacturing and distribution center in the Southeast. 
In 1904, John Hampton Adams and J. Henry Millis and 11 other investors consolidated manufacturing of various textiles into a single focus, hosiery. They consolidated the Piedmont Mills, the Kernersville Knitting Company, the Pioneer Hosiery Company, and the Consolidated Millis Company. The companies quickly became nationally prominent in manufacturing. The High Point Hosiery Mill also played a national role in the efforts to bring the use of child labor to light. The National Child Labor Committee was founded in 1904, and they were part of an early 20th century reform movement that set out on a mission of promoting the rights, awareness, dignity, well-being, and education of children and youth. Working as an investigative photographer for the committee, Lewis Hine documented working and living conditions of children in the United States between 1908 and 1924. The Lewis Hine collection consists of more than 5,100 photographic prints and can be found online at the Library of Congress. In 1913, Adams and Millis built the Highland Cotton Mills to have a direct supply of material for the hosiery mills. In 1927, there was another consolidation. Adams became the president and manager of the Adams Millis Corporation after Millis's death. The mill had a prominent role in High Point's commerce until the mill closed in 1995. Mill companies across the country built houses for workers to live in known as mill villages. They would also build community centers and churches for their workers. This was part of the economic shift of the Southeast during the New South industrial era of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Life in what was known as a company town was hard Companies often had mandates in order to live in the village that kept their workers in a cycle of debt, making it easy for the company to ignore work conditions and difficult for the workers to leave. The Mill Village is part of the Highland Cotton Mills Historic District. The district was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2014. Five years after Adams built the Highland Cotton Mills, he completed his Renaissance Revival style home on Main Street. In 1918, the house was a head-turning, progressive design for a city that still had dirt roads. Its eclectic mix of Italianate, Beaux-Arts, Mediterranean, and Prairie School design features announced in glowing stucco to the sleepy Piedmont region that Adams had made it. It was designed by architect Henry Thomas Parnum of Richmond, Virginia. Adams and Millis were not the only manufacturers in High Point. Commissioned by industrialist F.M. Pickett, the Pickett Cotton Mill was designed by Richard C. Bieberstein and completed in 1916. J.J. Ferris reported, the mill construction is of brick with reinforced concrete and iron. The copper guttering and pipe has lead splashings. These modern points of construction make the mill one of the best and safest in every way. The mill was expanded and operated by the Pickett family into the late 20th century. A few associated mill houses also stand. The Pickett Cotton Mill was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2015. High Point's early industrial buildings are critical in documenting the transformation of High Point to a manufacturing center in the decades surrounding 1900 and the growth of that industry in the following decades. And grow High Point did. In 1908, High Point had dozens of manufacturers from pipes to pipe organs that covered thousands of acres with warehouses, such as the Continental Furniture Company, the Dalton Furniture Company, the Globe Home Furniture Company, the High Point Furniture Company, the Rankin Casket Company, the Tate Furniture Company, and many, 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 many others. That's a lot of warehouses, buildings, and people. At the beginning of the 1920s, the Sheraton Hotel was constructed to meet the needs of visiting business people from around the world coming to the internationally renowned furniture market. At the opening of the new Sheraton Hotel on November 22, 1921, the list of directors was a who's who of High Point, with John Hampton Adams, Jonathan Elwood Cox, and Francis Marion Pickett in attendance. 
Charles C. Hartman and William Lee Stoddart designed the hotel with sleek lines and the refined Art Deco details. It was featured in the Architectural Review two years after it opened. Hartman was a successful architect from New York who moved to Greensboro to design notable commercial buildings in the triad, but was best known for his work with the National Park Service, designing the Mile High Swinging Bridge for Grandfather Mountain in 1952. The hotel retains its interior floor tile and its original ironwork stair, and the facade retains its original Art Deco stonework. Like the Sheraton Hotel that presented crisp lines and the refined details of the progressive era, the 1926 Zollerkoffer House in the Johnson Street Historic District exhibits the character-defining features of the prairie style. Developed by Frank Lloyd Wright, the style uses height, proportion, and intersecting lines in a celebration of well-balanced asymmetry. Instead of decorative features being the focus of the design, as with revival styles, the form in the prairie style takes precedence. The Zollicoffer House was the prairie style's response to the four square homes that were occupying street after street of American neighborhoods in the first two decades of the 20th century. The exaggerated flat eaves overhanging the form on the front, but clipping the chimney at the back, takes the plane of a square and changes its dimensional qualities depending upon your perspective. The interplay of vertical and horizontal planes creates interest on an otherwise square form. Not all High Point residents were interested in progressive design. Manufacturing moguls in High Point amassed incredible wealth. Taking long world tours was in vogue at the time. And when they came back from Great Britain or Spain or Morocco, they built homes in revival styles that evoked the feelings of their journeys and also exhibited the opulence allowed by their bank accounts. Tudor revival style homes were very popular and architect Harry Barton was well known for designing some of the best examples in North Carolina. He designed the S.H. Tomlinson House in 1924. Polychromatic slate roof tiles, exposed timbers, stuccoed walls on gable ends, varied roof lines with multiple stepped wings, and elaborately presented vestibules with segmented, or you guessed it, Tudor arches, are some of the hallmarks of this elaborate revival style. Nationally, Tudor revival began to wane in the 1920s, but it was popular in the Piedmont well into the 1940s. Likely one reason for this was the connection to the British cottage-inspired hunting estates in the area that had been home away from home for local business people since the turn of the century. As this 1930s Norman Revival house by noted architect Luther Lashmitt attests, High Point was still smitten with Tudor and Norman Revival style houses at the same time Agatha Christie's murder mysteries set in expansive British country estates were popular reads. I wonder where they got their design ideas. Tudor and Norman revival styles didn't have a monopoly on large-scale homes in High Point. Italian Renaissance revival style piqued the interest of George T. Penny in 1927. His house was a response to the seemingly haphazard organization of mass and form of the Tudor and Norman revival style houses around High Point. His Italian Renaissance revival style house condensed its mass into an imposing rectangular form with stories of differing heights. The shorter second story emphasized the grand first story, or piano nobile. Equidistantly placed arched window surrounds mimic the Italian use of arcades. Slightly recessed, the window surrounds evoke the niche or apse design found in classical architecture, especially found on the exteriors of European cathedrals. The single baluster from the railing in the front of the house, portico balcony and wing balconies, were inspired by the shape of Roman candlesticks. The symmetry of the design allows elaborate features to shine with the order of sacred geometry. The mid-1920s Harper House is a distinct contrast to the Penny House. 
The simple two-story form with low-pitched ceramic tile roof has a first-story porch addition and onion-domed circular porch with spiral columns that are in the forefront, while the main part of the house is in the background. The proportion of the porch and dome is out of scale with the house, but in a delightful, playful manner. This house is all fantasy and fairy tale and indicative of the individualism embraced by High Point movers and shakers. Another revival style popular in High Point was the Dutch colonial revival style. R.T. Amos Sr. was the founder of Amos Hosiery Mills and he hired Winston-Salem firm Northrop and O'Brien to construct his Dutch colonial revival style home in 1934. Dutch colonial revival style was especially popular in the Piedmont because of the area's connection to early settlers who had immigrated from Germany. Dutch was an anglicized term and a version of Deutsche or German. They weren't really Dutch. The Amos house has the quintessential Dutch colonial feature of the hooded entryway. The hooded entryway is placed centrally to the form in an overhanging eave that spans the full facade and creates a porch another common Dutch colonial feature. The shed-roofed multi-bay dormer of the second story, the flared eaves, and the exterior chimneys at both gable ends are also hallmarks of this revival style. The Amos house was constructed almost 20 years after the Renolda house in Winston-Salem, probably the most famous Dutch colonial style home in the area. They have similarities, although they do not share architects. Renolda House has a more classical form with pedimented front gables at either end of the second story dormer. This is an influence from the Philadelphia School of Architecture practiced by the Renolda House's architect, Charles Barton Keene. Both Keene and Northrup had projects with R.J. Reynolds. It was very common for those in the upper echelon of social circles in Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and High Point to find inspiration from their neighbors. From the late 1930s and into the 1950s, Louis Voorhees was High Point's most esteemed and prolific architect of the mid 20th century. A student of Fisk Kimball, he became well-versed in revival style architecture but took strides later in Art Deco and modern styles. He and his partner, Eccles D. Everhart, had enough work in High Point that they did not often tread outside Guilford and Forsyth counties. His works include the Guilford County Office and Court Building, constructed in 1937 in the Art Modern style, the Pearl M. and S. Colin Volcanon House, constructed in 1935, also with Art Modern features, and the U.S. Post Office building constructed in 1932 in the Art Deco style. There are three figures on the frieze of the Post Office building that represent the three main industries of the city, furniture, textiles, and agriculture. The differences between Art Deco and Art Modern is that Art Deco focuses upon stylized surface ornamentation, like the post office building, and the Art Modern focuses on the streamlined form with an abstract aesthetic, like the curved walls of the Van Cannon House. One of the earliest examples of modern architecture in High Point is the Nancy Gibb White House, constructed in 1954. Winston-Salem architect Lamar Northrup designed the house, German-born Mies van der Rohe influenced Northrop's design. The flat roof, equidistant mullions in the curtain wall windows of the facade, and the low rectangular form that's built into the grade of the landscape are hallmarks of the modernist design ethos that sought to redefine the classical pursuit of clarity through modern materials, line, and form while creating large open interiors. After World War II, mid-century modern design made a big splash in High Point, as the city was, and is, full of designers of everything, from dressers to mirrors. People whose work it was to anticipate trends were eager and willing to try new and different dwelling forms. Robert Connor designed his house in 1956 and used rough-cut western red cedar on a modern form. The juxtaposition of the rustic exterior 
and dramatically angled roof lines create an engaging contrast. Part of the modern residential design ethos was how simple and open design allowed the outdoors into the home with broad roof to ceiling windows that gave interiors lots of natural light and views that one could almost step into. Leon Shute designed the modernist Haslip Funeral Home, part of the Washington Street Historic District. J.C. Burton was the mason and H. A. Phipps and Son was the contractor and constructed the building in 1961. The building has a recessed hyphen design with prominent north and south wings. The distinctive concrete panels separated by columns of colored panels create focus and contrast. Louis B. Haslip was active in the community and a member of the NAACP, the Carl Chavez YMCA, and the Furniture City Elks Lodge. The African-American neighborhood of Washington Street, where the funeral home is located, comprised businesses that African-Americans owned and operated during segregation. A center of black commerce, Washington Street was lined with successful businesses and community spaces that served the black population of High Point that was not allowed equal access to other public spaces and businesses. It's here that I pause and acknowledge the lack of examples of African-American designed architecture in this presentation. Historic examples of African-American architects work or work by other architects of color in North Carolina during the historic period before 1970 is not easily found. Most firms that hired black architects did not advertise the fact and they did not include their names in the list of architects and designers involved in buildings construction. Voorhees and Everhart employed black architects in High Point with Hampton University graduate Willix Emanuel Merritt Jr. joining the firm after World War II. But Merritt moved to Michigan within a few years. While there are historic examples of black architects work elsewhere in North Carolina, research endeavors to find examples in High Point and celebrate black talent in North Carolina's historic architectural record. If you would like to learn more about black architects and firms in North Carolina, like John Merrick and Associates and others, the North Carolina Mar Modernist website and the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission are organizations that are actively curating online databases and exhibits. If you would like to explore the historic architecture of High Point or even your hometown, go to the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office website, HPO Web. The nonprofit group Preservation Greensboro Incorporated also often has talks and walks on architecture in cities across the triad. The book Architecture of High Point is available for purchase in the High Point Planning Office or at the High Point Museum. Thank you so much for listening.